in Jesus saves. Simple faith in Jesus is simple faith in the forgiver of sins. Jesus is the forgiver of sins. So simple faith in Jesus is simple faith in the forgiver of sins. Simple faith rejoices in the forgiveness of its sins. Because simple faith is in Jesus, and Jesus is the forgiver of sins. If you have simple faith in Jesus, you have simple faith in the forgiver of sins, and therefore simple faith rejoices in the forgiveness of its sins. Simple faith in Jesus saves. If you have simple faith in Jesus, you are saved. If you do not have simple faith in Jesus, you are not saved. Simple faith in Jesus will confess its sins. Simple faith in Jesus confesses its sins because it has simple faith in Jesus that Jesus is the forgiver of sins. And if Jesus is the forgiver of sins and simple faith believes in Jesus, then simple faith will confess its sins. Now let's be clear about what we mean by simple faith will confess its sins. Confession of sins is not something that you do once and it is all over with, as some Protestants say. Confession of sins is not something that you do over and over and over again, as Rome says. Simple faith in Jesus has the attitude of always confessing its sins. It is an attitude of the heart. It is a status of the being. It is a status of mind wherein, whenever simple faith is confronted with its sins, simple faith will confess it. And so the confession of sins that we recite at the beginning of almost every divine service here in Emmanuel is an expression of simple faith. It does not constitute simple faith. When you are saying your prayers before you go to bed at night and you ask God for forgiveness for the sins of the day, that is an expression of simple faith. It does not constitute simple faith. Simple faith in Jesus is an attitude of the heart. Simple faith in Jesus is a way of living. It is a way of being. It is a status of always, each and every moment of every day, willing to confess and admit its sins. And not only does it confess its sins, it confesses the sinful condition that produces all of these sins. It confesses the attitude of the heart that tries to live apart from God. It confesses the attitude of the heart that worships other gods, that fears, loves, and trusts in other things other than God. You were taught in junior catechesis to call it original sin. Simple faith not only confesses its sins, it confesses its sin. And ironically enough, simple faith rejoices in its confession. Even though the confession of sins is often painful, even though the attitude of the heart that is always willing to confess its sins is a humble and humiliating attitude, simple faith nevertheless rejoices in these things because simple faith believes in Jesus, and Jesus is the forgiver of sins. Simple faith saves. Have you ever tried to forgive somebody and they got mad at you for doing so? Somebody said yes. You ever had this experience? You say, I forgive you, and the person whom you are forgiving gets upset at you. They become angry with you for forgiving them. And even though you're not going to hold their sin against them, and they really ought to rejoice in that, they are angry with you for forgiving them. The reason that they are angry with you for forgiving them is because when you forgive them, you are saying that what they did was wrong. And if they're the kind of person that is trying to establish their own righteousness, then they're going to be upset with you whenever you point out to them that something that they did is wrong. And so when you forgive them, they're upset. They do not rejoice in the forgiveness of sins. They despise the forgiveness of sins. They despise the forgiveness of sins because the forgiveness of sins means that they are sinners. That is precisely what they do not wish to confess. So it is with everyone who is trying to establish their own righteousness. So it is with everyone who tries to establish their own righteousness that is by law, and not receive the righteousness that is by faith. People who try to establish their own righteousness usually try to do it in one of three ways. 
either they will lower God's standards in order to make them a little easier to keep, or they will compare themselves to other sinful people and tell themselves, well, at least I am better than those folks, and certainly the TV set provides us with plenty of people with which we can compare ourselves and deem ourselves much more righteous than them. Or they will try to boost the appearance of their own righteousness by downplaying their own sins. Usually, people who are trying to establish their righteousness do all three of these things. But the one that is interesting to simple faith that confesses its sins is the last one. The ones who seek to establish their own righteousness that is by law and not by faith downplay their own sins. They try to hide their own sins. They try to present a facade of righteousness. They hope that they, if they can fool other people into thinking that they are righteous, they can fool God too. And when somebody comes along and forgives them of their sins, it is revealed that they don't have this righteousness that they've been trying to pretend that they have, and they're mad. And so it is with the chief priests and the Pharisees. Here comes the chief priests and the Pharisees, and here comes the forgiver of sins. You can guarantee that there is going to be a conflict between them. The more Jesus announces his grace and mercy, the more he bestows the forgiveness of sins, the more enraged and outraged the chief priests and the Pharisees become wanting to establish a righteousness of their own. They dare not accept his forgiveness. And then when he points out to them their sins, they are enraged and they must silence him. Here he is. He will wreck our entire righteousness scheme. We must do away with him. Don't you understand that if we let him go on like this, the whole world will go after him, and then what will we chief priests and Pharisees have? And so they plot how they might kill him. Since simple faith rejoices in the forgiveness of its sins. Simple faith rejoices in confessing its sins. If simple faith rejoices in confessing its sins, then simple faith will rejoice in every messenger that God sends to it to correct it for its sins. The book of Proverbs says it this way, a wise man heeds correction. But a foolish man keeps on going and suffers for it. A wise man heeds instruction, but a fool is wise in his own eyes. With these exhortations, the book of Proverbs pushes us toward simple faith that receives correction from others. Those who are trying to establish their own righteousness will not receive correction from anybody. They will resent it and hate it. And so it is with the chief priests and the Pharisees. God sent them prophets, and he sent them more prophets. And every time God sent them prophets, the prophets would correct them for their faithlessness and idolatry, for the sin that produces all other sins. And every time, they resented the prophets. They killed some, they beat some, and they stoned some. And God kept sending them to them. God defies human reason in his patience and long-suffering. It may sound optimistic when in his parable, the Lord says, they will respect my son. But I do not think it is a character of God to be optimistic. God is far more of a realist to be optimistic. Rather, that is an expression of God's long-suffering, that he will do absolutely everything defying human reason in order to bring his people to repentance so that he might be the forgiver of sins and they might rejoice in his forgiveness. He defies human reason in this way. If the President of the United States were to send an ambassador to a foreign country and the foreign government to whom he was sent murdered the ambassador, should the President send another one? And if the president did send another one, it may be two or three, and two or three of them got murdered by the government to whom the president sent them, 
don't you think there would eventually be an outcry in the media saying that the president should discontinue this practice of sending these ambassadors to these people who did nothing but kill them? And yet, in spite of that fact, God keeps sending his ambassadors unto Israel. And even though they kill one, beat one, and stone another, he keeps sending them. And finally, when he's done, he has sent them his son. And his son is the forgiver of sins. And since they cannot tolerate the forgiveness of their sins, trying to establish a righteousness of their own, they draw him out of the vineyard, out of Jerusalem, and they crucify him outside. Don't you think it is more than fair that the master of the vineyard give the vineyard to somebody else? One of the reasons that God is so long-suffering and, so, and that he sends so many prophets is so that when he does finally take the vineyard from the chief priests and the Pharisees and gives it to somebody else, it is crystal clear that he is just in doing so. In fact, the Lord God is beyond justice in doing it. He should have taken the vineyard from them long ago, according to simple justice. But in his long-suffering, he gave them plenty of chances. And now finally they have killed the son. The vineyard will be taken from them and given to somebody else. Not even their temple will survive. For when the disciples said to the Lord Christ, Look at this beautiful temple. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be left upon another. And then Jesus goes on to provide in detail a description about how the Romans will come, destroy Jerusalem, tear down the temple, and burn the whole thing to the ground. And one stone is not left upon another of that temple yet to this day. And the vineyard has been given to somebody else. A people producing its fruits. And what are the fruits of the vineyard? Well, John the Baptist told you what the fruits of the vineyard are when he preached a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. He said to those chief priests and Pharisees, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And so that is the fruit of the kingdom. The fruit of the kingdom is a simple faith that confesses its sins. The kingdom has been taken away from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and it has been given to everybody who confesses their sins. Everyone who confesses their sins has a simple faith in Jesus, for Jesus is the forgiver of sins. If you do not have the simple faith of Jesus, the stone that the builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone, will fall upon you and crush you. So bear fruit in keeping with repentance, because the Lord will take the vineyard from those who do not produce it and give it to anybody who does. <laughs>